This is Your Pain Game Podcast, where we talk about the game of living in and with chronic pain and trauma, getting to the heart of how to heal. I am your host, Lindsay Soprano. On the show, I plan on discussing with doctors, chronic pain patients, holistic practitioners, loved ones, and anybody that is interested in having their voice heard in the chronic pain and trauma world that we live in. So on this show, we definitely talk a lot about Western medicine and how I feel about it, right? And our standard of care. There's no standard. (laughs) I don't feel like there is, in my opinion, because it's super low if it is, especially here in the States. I can only speak to the United States here and more specifically, California. But taking my health into my own hands with my CRPS and Lyme disease and EBV and you just name it, I've got it all, right? It's been nothing short of a tremendous obstacle course for me. You know, doctor after doctor after doctor, nobody talking to each other, nobody, nobody really owning my care. And so I was like, well, wait a second. I shouldn't hold all of these people responsible for my care. I need to do it. And so when I decided to take that step and really own it and hold everybody accountable, things started to shift, right? And I think that a lot of the, our healthcare system, however it is run in, our, in the States, it's almost like they feel like we're fucking stupid. You know, like we're on to you guys, okay? And we're starting to get more and more and more aware of what's actually going on in conventional medicine. And it's, you guys know there's nothing conventional about me. <laughs> I require complete unconventional care, right? And I think all of us really do because none of us are the same person. We can't treat me like I'm going to treat my guest right now, right? We can't do that because we're all so very, very different. And I require empowerment. I don't know about you guys, but empowerment feels pretty damn good. And I'm going to quote my guest today. I don't love that the institutions and individuals who run the world would like to believe that we are powerless when it comes to our health and wellness, right? It's time for us to take our power back. I'm exhausted from feeling like I cannot choose my own healthcare regimen, right? My body, my choice. I know we hear that all of the time, especially when it comes to abortion and so on and so forth. Cliche or not, it's true. So advocating for myself in the world of chronic pain and trauma is a full-time job, but we're not alone in it. As soon as you accept that you're not alone in it and you've got people like me and my guests here on your side, you're a winner. And wait until you get to know this guy because he is a hoot. We already had about 30 minutes before the episode cracking up. Cracking up. Cracking up. (laughs) So let's talk about it, all right? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my guest today, Dr. Nathan Riley. What is going on over there? You know what's going on? I, I told you about my my motorcycle, my not motorcycle. Thank God, my mountain biking accident. I got a big <laughs> swollen cheek. I don't know if we if you end up using video, but damn, my uh, face hurts. Apart from great. that, I'm just doing my jam. I'm just living life here. I'm I'm enjoying my time here already with you. So oh thanks for my gosh, me. well I love, I know I we could seriously do like a three four hour <laughs> Jones just together. <laughs> Well, Dr. Riley is a board-certified OBGYN and fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He's going to talk to us a little bit today about stepping away from this conventional medicine that we were talking about, but specifically in the maternity care model and how he made his choice to move into his truth to uphold the traditional practice of midwifery. I mean, he's all about rattling the cage, right? He supports midwives as a collaborative physician for midwives of all varieties and is an advocate for home birth, which is amazing. He also requires empowerment, right? And he leads from a place of that spot to empower women to have babies on their own terms using nature as their guide. So I'm rolling out the red carpet for you, babe. <laughs> I, oof, I know it's Couldn't a good have said it better myself. Carpet. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. <laughs> well, I'd like to start talking about when you got fed up with conventional medicine and why, and then let's take it from there. Oh, Lindsay, you know I've gone through. I've I've done quite a bit of healing uh, around this topic. You know, you have to imagine you invest about a half a million dollars in your education, and then you give up your your twenties, some of your thirties, and then you hope that you emerge on the other side 
like being so stoked about what you do. And, and unfortunately, I wasn't that guy. I was actually really, really discouraged by what I ended up finding, you know, the specialty that I found myself in. And I actually did more training, like a, a real, you know, masochist. I went to hospice and palliative care fellowship at um, UCSD down in, in San Diego. And uh, I did started my healing journey there. And when I'm saying healing, guys, I'm not meaning like my face that's beat up from the, the mountain biking accident. I mean, like, <laughs> like a real blow to my, to my like, like though, who am I? What am I doing here? Question. You know, like I thought that I was going to be doing good work. And then you realize, oh, I could make good money, but I'm going to just be making money for this kind of profit driven medical system that doesn't really seem to give a damn about anybody, including me. In fact, during COVID, I got fired. I was doing hospice work. Um, I, I gave up the hospital position as an OBGYN. I went into hospice work and I was loving it. It was just like so just, my life was just so full and I loved getting as much time as I wanted with these, these clients and their families who were just going through the, the mortality conversation. And I took my mask off caring for this old guy who was dying of heart failure and I got fired the next day. And it was like, I'm not even irreplaceable. Like there is nothing special about me. I invested and sacrificed all of this time and money, decades, decades to this. And they could just fire me and replace me just like that. And so it was kind of the universal nudge that I needed. I don't think I would have had the courage to step away on my own, but I, I, it gave me that sort of, I like was shoved out the, you know, the cabin door, you know, and whenever you start having second thoughts about skydiving and they're just like, you're going, right? Like I kind of <laughs> needed that. Otherwise I think yeah. I would have chickened out. But since having done that, my life has, has been dramatically different and I can actually show up for people now in the way that I would like to be treated if I ever go back to the hospital again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you went from doing in the hospital setting, you went from conventional and you moved into this beautiful space that you've created for yourself, your yeah. family, your children, and obviously all of the people that you help support from a midwifery perspective and all of that. But I want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. But I also want you to explain to us the difference between a midwife and a doula. I, I think that it would be good for our audience to understand the difference between those as we move forward. Right. So let's describe what a birth in the hospital generally looks like, whether you have a certified nurse midwife, which is an RN who goes for additional training, and becomes a certified nurse midwife. You've got that or you've got an OBGYN. That's really the two options for having a baby in the hospital. And a hospital is a great place for the emergency. It's like if you got sepsis, if you lose a leg, I mean, hell, there's a lot of reasons to go to the hospital. Tibfid. Yeah, tibfid. <laughs> um, so like, you know, the things that we think about, those really, really catastrophic things, great, we have hospitals. When you think about how birth, so the way that a hospital is able to do that is they've got all these resources, all these medications, all these staff, they have to be very efficient and they have to be very effective. But your goal, if you split your head open, is to not die and for that to get sutured up or repaired in some way, right? Right. The goal with birth is you don't want the mom or the baby to die. And so at all costs, we're going to do what is required for that mom and baby to stay alive, even if it means that mom has a tremendous burden of pain or uh, distrust in the system, or she's got unresolved trauma in her body from being strapped crucifixion style down to an operating room table in order to have her guts operated on, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the experience is. Forget the journey. We just want that outcome. And if we can do that outcome with great efficiency, meaning we're both effective and efficient, we can say that we did a good job. That's how a trauma operating room works. Thank goodness we have that. But is that really required for birth? On the flip side, in the home, or let's say out of hospital experience, which is less than, it's about 1% of births maybe in the United States right now. Only 1%? Maybe wow. 1%. I'm yeah, surprised I mean, at that actually. It's very, huh. very, very low. Um, out of the hospital, you can do a birth center. You can have a baby with at home with your midwife. You can have it in a hotel. You can have it out in the woods with the coyotes. It doesn't really matter. It's out of hospital. The air team you put together, they are not as focused on efficiency and efficacy. They're actually focused on you and everything surrounds you. So this is really the hospice care model of caring for people with chronic illness, where it's like, if we can't save the day with the heroics of pharmaceuticals and surgery, then at least let's ask what's important to you and let's, let's put our resources in an, in, in an arrangement that serves you based on your goals. 
That is not what happens in maternity care in the hospital. It does happen in home birth. And they're still, they're actually probably more effective at achieving that healthy mom, healthy baby without the additional burdens of all the traumas that, that arise when you're not being consented well, you're not being spoken to well. You're just sort of a cog in this big giant system that is focused on efficiency, productivity, and profits over everything else. That is not the home birth experience. So in the home birth setting, usually it's a midwife. I attend home births, so I'm one of those rare doctors who goes into the home and sits there and waits until a baby comes. And if I need to bring in all of those super skills that I developed over the years, I will. But generally, you just sit there and wait and a baby comes out and you say, congratulations, and you go home. Very, very different experience. If you were to need some, if you were craving, and I recommend everybody seek this out, some additional advocacy and actual labor support, a doula is the person who's there. They're an unbiased, no skin in the game, third-party bystander that you can yell at, that you can hold hands with, you can hug and cry with, you can do all of that, but they're not going to be the ones intervening or helping you decide if you need to go to the hospital. They're the emotional support side of it more so, right? Everything else. Yeah. Yeah. They're not healthcare professionals. So they don't, you know, they might advocate, they might give you some information, but they're not your midwife. They're not your doctor. That duo of a midwife and a doula is absolutely the best option for, I'd say, upwards of 85, 90% of women in the United States. Wow. But yeah. people are still kind of confused about the difference. So midwives well, that's have why great I outcomes. asked because yeah, because I, I yeah. asked the same thing because I've not I've not gone through um I, I got pregnant one time and I lost the baby and it was many, many, many years ago. But so I've never gone through the birthing process. I've never yeah. gone through pregnancy. I've never gone through those things. So I can't speak to what that feels like, but I know how I would want it to be. And I think when, you know, all of us little girls like, oh, this is what my wedding's going to be like. This is what's going to be having the baby. Like, Well, it gets completely jaded and booted out from what we thought it was going to be like, right? But yeah. I do know that I would have gone somewhere in more of the range of what you're talking about, doing a home birth, doing something, but having someone like you on the, on the team of care because you're an actual MD and it's yeah. not, I mean, you do, you do work in the woo-woo world, which I love about you. And I love the woo-woo world as a whole. But I like that that gives such a, like an awesome feeling of security and safety because it's a fearful time when you're a woman and you're like, I don't know. I mean, I've had girlfriends that have lost their babies. And so that's scary stuff. And when you're yeah. walking in, in, in that not knowing how your body may or may not fail you, feeling, feeling scared, especially if you're alone, you know, single moms and all of that. So I love that. That, that blend, that, that partnership between you and the doula and the midwife, I think it's just, I mean, it's beautiful. And you talk about the transition and the spiritual transformation and honoring the sacred practice of us populating the damn planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if we're going to just have the goal of making more people and those people are breathing and their hearts beating after the process, then we should have no issues with maternity care, but we have plenty of issues. I've had so many women who come to me and they're like, doc, I will not go back to the hospital. And I could spend my time then arguing on behalf of the hospital system that, hey, there's, it's safe there. They have medicines, they have operating rooms. Don't you want those things? But I don't do that. Instead, I say, what happened in your previous birth? And the stories that I'm hearing every single day, if I were to ignore that, it would be almost unethical for me to keep doing it in the hospital. So even a person who has an unmedicated, physiologic, vaginal birth without any epidural, without any medications, and it only takes two hours, that sounds like a pretty dreamy dreamy experience, except that was my wife's experience, and she did not feel good about it. There was something about how she was being spoken to, about the energy in the room, around how she was being touched. Like She just felt like she was a part of this assembly line thing. And that is not, that is not what most women want from this this what I would say a sacred transformation. This is not a medical procedure and, and you're not, you don't have a disease just because you got pregnant. <laughs> so why are we going to the hospitals? Like if that's for sick people, why are we doing this in the hospital? Well, maternity units make more money for hospitals than any other unit in the hospital, period. Wow. It's the most profitable and the more, the faster you can get them in and out, there's that efficiency piece. The faster your team is able to run and get these things and get them in and get their baby out and add medicines to speed it up, the more, the faster you can do that, the more money we can make. I hate to say it, but it is very much a profit and productivity driven uh, philosophy, I suppose, that we see in hospitals. Yeah. (laughs) 
Um, and then, of course, fear plays a big part into this. Doctors don't want to be sued. Doctors don't want to have a dead baby on their hands. And I say dead baby very deliberately. A baby dies. A baby is not breathing, and they are not going to grow up into a 12-year-old playing soccer. That is one of the more tremendously hard things for us to carry. And nobody talks about it. Nobody, you know, we don't have social support. Everybody wants to blame somebody. It gets into this weird, like, you know, like uh, fucking maelstrom of energy when all that a person probably really needs is just to be held and to be loved and to be told like, it's going to be okay. You're never going to heal from this totally. It's just something that we have to help you integrate. Otherwise, it becomes trauma that is unresolved in the body. I know you talk a lot about this, but instead, you know, people are compelled to not talk about this and they don't even want to say dead baby. They say things like a baby passed away. No, the baby fucking died. And part of the reason is that we're pushing the babies out before they have to come. Like, why are we messing with this process? If we get out of the way, which is what midwives and doulas do, generally babies do just fine. And occasionally babies need to be transferred to the hospital in order to get a little bit of support or mom needs to be transferred. But, you know, all of this is to say that even though women are going in and having, you know, natural physiologic vaginal births, a lot of them are saying, I did not feel good about that. And then they say, I'm not doing that again. And once you start to unpack that and connect with people, human connection is critical for this, um, then you can start to help kind of ease them into their next pregnancy. And that's what I get the joy of doing so that we can help to resolve that trauma and we can get some of that fear and some of that shit that was thrown at them in their previous births. Jade, get that out of the way. We have to focus on this incredible transformation that's coming anew in nine months after you get that positive pregnancy test. I. <laughs> I've got the chills the entire time that you were speaking just now. It's it's in my brain. I have, and I unfortunately I've had to go to the ER and all this baloney fairly recently. And it wasn't because I was having a baby. It was because I was, my pain level was so high. It was just like this is stupid. I'm calling nine one one, which I never do. So for me to do that is like crazy. That's just me. I don't have a baby in my belly. I don't have another person that's going to be coming out. I was frustrated the entire time that I was in the hospital and I was, there was nothing special about me. It was just like, we don't know. We, it, it was just such an unnerving place to be. And I feel like if that's the place that we are, when we're going to be giving birth, yeah. how, how does that affect the A, experience, obviously, but B, how does that impact the child? And when it, when it comes out and it's like, smack them, go get out of here. We got another girl down the hall. that's on coming in behind you. Like, how, how does that affect the child? Yeah, it's, it's actually the question that's been on my mind recently. In fact, next week, a podcast that I did with doctors Monique Andrews and Tamara McIntyre, um, they have a, a, a program called um, the Prana Foundation and some other, they're chiropractors, but actually they've, they've, gone, they've become deeply invested in polyvagal theory. We get into this topic in particular, and I know that you're familiar because I've listened to your show. So when a baby's developing in the uterus, I'm going to, there's so many ways to answer your question. I know, um, I know. <laughs> but but I, yeah, I, I think this actually is related also to the conversation around hospital versus home birth. And why would, on earth would somebody want to be so irresponsible to have an out-of-hospital birth? We did it in our second, and it was healing for my wife, who had a natural physiologic vaginal birth, her first in a hospital setting with a great OBGYN and a great team. But something didn't feel right. The home birth, was full circle for her. It was ecstatic. It was, I don't think she would use the word pleasurable, but she did not use words like, I was afraid. I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel like I was in control. Like she was completely in control because everything is centered around you. So the reason that that's important is that as a baby develops inside the uterus, we've got the nervous system, right? We've got our brain, we've got a spinal cord, we've got a bunch of nerves going in and out of the spinal cord, transmitting information to your processing center, whatever you want to call it. Um, from the outside, right? This is how we get around. This is how we know where to walk, how to move our body. We know somebody's, you know, talking to us. Like, ooh, this is important. But the nervous system's always been described in a very simplistic way. I think overly simplistic, that you have a, a gas pedal and a brake. You've got your sympathetic and parasympathetic. And that's not, in, it's true that you have that, but it's not entirely true. In fact, polyvagal theory has helped, helped provide me with such a a, a more productive way of looking at this, especially as a baby is developing in the uterus. And as an advocate for home birth, I now have more of a reason, um, more of a, a compulsion for this to become the default as opposed to the exception in the United States. So when a baby's growing inside the uterus, first, 
they develop the lower part of their nervous system, their dorsal vagal. This is the freeze. This is where if you are, you know, being threatened, you just freeze up and you go inward. Like it's, it's the deer in headlights kind of thing. Yeah. That is um, going to be associated with like a heart rate that's in like the 60s or 70s. And you can tell this by looking at a baby's heart rate. They have a low heart rate. And then suddenly the second trimester happens. And now their sympathetic tone picks up. This is the, um, the, the flight or fight part. This is the cranked up heart rate. You're ready to rock. The MMA fighters, they've got a lot of sympathetic tone, catecholamines, epinephrine and whatnot, circulating, flooding them. You don't feel pain as much. Like you're ready to rock. You're going to wrestle and fight to the death. That develops and, you're, and the baby's heart rate cranks up into the, maybe the 180 even range, you know, 180, 200. And then the third trimester happens and you get a, a sort of an, an equilibrium and you end up in the, the range that most people associate with a healthy baby, which is 110 to 160. That third part that develops is called the ventral vagal component of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's the I am. It's when you're the most fully embodied best version of you. Most of us are living in the I can, which is the sympathetic. And then hopefully not many of us, although some of us are definitely living in that dorsal vagal, which is the I can't. It's the freeze. You withdraw from the world. The chronic depression, people with chronic pain end up in that space quite a bit. The reason this is relevant to birth is that the baby starts developing the I am, that, that, that sort of final piece of their nervous system through the third trimester and into six months of life. Mm. Why is this relevant to birth? Well, if you take a baby out, the baby comes out of the womb and we immediately are blasting it with loud noises, harsh touch, sharp needles in the heels, goop on the eyes, just this crazy fucking alien space where they were in the amniotic universe and now they're suddenly in this battlefield, that is going to inhibit their ability to fully clarify and balance out their nervous system through the lens of polyvagal theory. So it's not just acceleration or break. Now here's the key. The alternative to the hospital setting, the out-of-hospital setting where what my wife and I had, 90 minutes of labor total. Baby was asleep on my wife's chest right afterwards. And what, what were we doing? Oh, Everly, oh, you're here. Look at your little hands and toes. My wife's heart is beating. Her, my, our baby girl, her heart's beating with my wife. They're breathing together. She's feeling the rise and fall. This is critical for the co-regulation. This co-regulation is critical for the development in the long-term well-being of a baby. So a preterm baby has a greater chance of sudden infant death syndrome. I think it's, I think it's you know, multifactorial, but a giant part of this is that they haven't developed the full complement of their nervous system and they're locked away in a little incubator and they're never being touched. Mom's voice isn't there at all times, 24-7, letting them know that you're safe. You're safe. I've got you. I'm your mom. We're going to do this together. That is what out of hospital birth looks like almost every time. And so when we think about the chronic illnesses that impact us, we get the nervous system, these neurologic you know, disorders, autism, depression, anxiety. I would be remiss if I didn't at least suggest that the fact that 40% of babies are coming out of the abdomen, not through the vagina, and not ending up right on their, their mother's beautiful, warm breasts, and like smelling one another, tasting one another, connecting through breastfeeding, that co-regulation is critical. And preterm babies don't get that, which is why suddenly their cardiovascular system just stops working. Their nervous system isn't fully developed. So this is really, really critical in our time, especially when we consider how many people were living in dorsal vagal during COVID, just afraid of everything in the world. You can't live, you can't survive in dorsal vagal. So, so we've got this big, big problem. And I think that that problem that we're seeing in the world, all of this anxiety and tension and angst and, and like just fear of one another, this starts at birth. We're programming this into our kids' nervous systems from day one of life. Everybody take a deep breath for just a second because that was a lot. And <laughs> uh, it was good to hear and also very sad to hear on, on some of these because I'm like, God, I'm just sitting here thinking like, I know all of my health issues. I know central. I know my central nervous system is jacked. I know that I've de dealt with anxiety and depression from a very, very, very young age. I was unable to, and so now I'm like, way to go, mom. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like, but we don't, we didn't know any of this stuff. No, I mean, of course not. Of course ancestrally, not. yes, we do inside of us because we were giving birth in, with a stick in our mouth in the middle of a forest somewhere in Scotland, you know, like, <laughs> give me a break. We did it before without all of this, right? Yeah. And so coming back into the spiritual side of it and the emotional support side of it and honoring that sacred practice and 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 experiencing the pain of birth but also not traumatizing yourself and your newborn baby i mean it's just it's nuts because when you think about hospital guys you think about the bright lights beeping noises like yep. sounds and tubes and needles and all of that that is what That's hospital scary. setting is it's yeah. sounds Even like an a adult. horror film <laughs> yeah i know yeah. The trauma from birth for both the mother and the child, I think is such an important topic to th- talk about because we just don't, we, we're so caught up in our systems and our big pharma and our hospitals and profit and all of it. At the end of the day, they're not thinking about this wonderful child that we're going to be bringing into this world. And we're already giving them a map of fear and safety issues and developmental potential issues. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's, it's, it's scary. It's really scary. So you come in and you do what now? So now you've got your business. You run the holistic OBGYN, right? You are this man. You come in and your service is to help who in this process? Yeah, you know, there's this idea around um, like amongst midwives who are in training and doctors who are in training where it's like, hey, hands off, like don't touch. The less you do, the better. Well, so there was a midwife who shared a, a message recently on Instagram. I can't remember her name, but she really brought up a really good point, which is like, if you want to be hands off in a birth, you have to earn that because only after you've seen so many catastrophes, do you know when you actually need to intervene? Like if you just have this magical thinking that nothing should be done, well, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself and you're actually maybe putting your client in harm. So when I say that I don't do anything, I say that I only, I should probably say I only do something if it's absolutely required of me. And that's because I know that when I start putting my hands where they don't belong, I create other issues that then require more intervention. And the less, inter, the less we intervene in this otherwise natural process, the better off everybody is. So having said that, um, when people come to me, <laughs> the first thing I try to do is I tell them, don't hire me, go find a midwife. <laughs> It's a terrible business model. Is that ri- I was just going to say, this, this is not a profit center. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, if I wanted to get rich, I'd still be in the hospital doing hysterectomies and, and putting people on birth control. So when um, they come to me, I say, well, tell me your story. And why is it that you want me to be at your birth, right? Like what happened in your previous birth? I had this traumatic thing happen or whatever. Have you considered hiring a midwife? No, because I heard midwives are this or that. You know, I, so I do a lot of dispelling there. And the reason I do that is because even though I think I'm the bee's knees, most experienced midwives out there are going to be able to do what midwives do way better than me, a wannabe midwife. Like I can't call myself a midwife, even though I practice like that, because that would be an insult to the lineages of badass women caring for women across the entire world. Like I don't want to encroach upon that. So going back to the story of me leaving the system, when I left, when I got fired, I mean, I'm using air quotes, but I was actually fired, like flat out fired for the mask thing. It was a very, very um, scary at first because we, we were just about to have a baby and we lost our health insurance and all of that. But I was like, okay, now I get to do things the way I want to do it. And I could have gone into home birth practice and found an average fee sort of structure that would work based on what other midwives were charging. But I kind of felt like, you know, midwives have taught me so much. I have learned how to be a better man, father, husband, and doctor because of midwives. If I really believe in changing maternity care, I know that midwives do this better. So let me actually lend my support to them. And I started collaborating with midwives around the country. I still do this because many states require midwives, CPM, CNMs, whatever, to have a supervising physician, which is the biggest bunch of baloney ever because physicians don't do midwifery. Why would they be supervising midwives? But anyways, in order to support them, they pay me on a monthly basis. They can reach out for consultation. I can write meds. I can sign orders, all of that for them. And despite my efforts there, I was still finding that women were coming to me. And if I, if I couldn't convince them to find a midwife, usually it was because they had some sort of condition that the midwife could not attend to. So like mm. preeclampsia or the baby's a little small, or maybe the baby's breech, or maybe there's twins and whatever, every state is a little different. So it was like, shit, you've had, I have a client coming up on Thanksgiving day, actually. She's had four C-sections 
and she's pregnant again. And she does not want to go into the hospital. Why? Because her fourth baby at the six-month vaccine visit, a couple days after that was paralyzed from the neck down and has Shit. now a feeding tube and a tracheostomy. So she's like, Doc, if you don't help me, I'm going to do it myself. And I was like, well, fuck, man. Like, I'm in. Like, I'm, I'm willing to help you. But the next step is, so, so I tell that because I'm only taking super high-risk people. And lo and behold, they're still doing just fine at home. But here's the kicker. And this I know is so important to you. In fact, I, I could talk to you on my podcast, and we'll do that in the future, around personal accountability. There's a lot of people out there that have working arms and legs they are white. They're set. We're just going to play into this, this whole narrative. Do you're it. white, cis, you're Catholic, and you have operational arms and legs, and you're good looking. If you get gestational diabetes or preeclampsia, I'm sorry, but you're not a very healthy person. And you didn't put all of those privilege cards to use in order to optimize your health and your childbirth experience. Now, that's not to say that there aren't exceptions. But what I did there is I said, I'm giving you every benefit of the doubt based on our societal's fuckery around who's the, the haves and the have nots. So in your case, I know that you've got, you've got, you know, this regional pain syndrome and whatnot. You can wake up every single day and say, well, fuck it. I'm just a person who has pain or whatever. Instead, I meet a person who's wears funny t-shirts, makes me laugh, is very pretty, and is just doing the best with what she's got. This is relevant to this birth conversation because everybody out there wants to have a dream birth, but they don't want to take accountability for their decisions. If you can just take responsibility right now for how you're showing up, how you're talking to people, how you're loving yourself, like how you're spending your time, where is your energy and focus going? Everything else changes, but that is something we are sorely lacking in the United States, especially in maternity care. So they have to, they have to have, a, I have a stern conversation that I cannot guarantee anything. I am here to apply my skill set to ensure that we get you to whatever your goal is. And if you say, hey, I'd rather have a dead baby on my hands than go back into the hospital. Okay, that's probably not the choice I would make or many other people would make. But that is you making an adult decision and I honor that. That's what we need so much more of, whether it's another COVID thing or whatever else, people just need to start taking responsibility for their actions and the outcomes of those actions. That's what freedom really looks like. And I don't think anybody even really appreciates what real freedom means. You're more free than so many people I, I know that are not bound by, you know, a pain disorder. Like you are like a ball of sunshine compared <laughs> to a lot of other people that don't make that. They actively decide not to be you. That's exactly day. right. It's so sad. Yeah. It is sad. And, and I think that, that that is, and thank you for all of the kind words that you said about me. I almost cried for just a second because everybody knows that I cry. Um, but it, it means a lot for me. me. <laughs> for, yeah, thank you <laughs> for you to say that. And um, it, it is, it is, it is advocating for yourself. And it's something that when I decided that I wanted to do this show, I came from a very different place than where I am right now. And so the original Pain Game podcast was not what it is today. It never started because it was not the right way for me to go about handling life stuff and coping with things and and the stress that it, that being in chronic pain all day and being sick all day puts on your body, puts on your spirit, puts on your spouse, puts on you know all of yeah. it. I mean, my sweetie's just like he's exhausted for me because he's watching this all unfold. But he also is my biggest cheerleader when it comes to he knows that I show fucking up every day and I advocate for myself and I'm advocating for other people. And that is why I am here. And that's why you are here. It sounds like you've got such a good healing, supportive, like your role and your advocacy for these people. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And it, what are you doing for us as a whole for women um, are you doing advocating for us? Like at what level are you doing that? Are you working with people in the government? Are you, I mean, outside of what you're doing on a day-to-day, -day, are you working on other things? I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't like using should, would, could. I probably okay. should That's be fair. in the governmental, like w politicking and all of that. Yeah. But there's a part of me that's a little bit cynical. Remember I described that like I was healing from the, you know, the journey and looking back and realizing that I waste my whole life, like from age right. 18, deciding I was going to be pre-med. Um, I guess I probably could take that approach, but there's a part of me that is still cynical about 
what is actually possible given our current state of affairs within our governmental institutions. I'm not like, I have no, I really don't give a shit if you vote red or blue. I've gone through periods recently of like, I don't even want to be in this country anymore. And that's not to say I'm not grateful for living here. It's just like, it's like you're giving me, who was it? South Park was like, you're giving me the option of a douchebag or a turd sandwich. (laughs) And I don't even believe that that, that elected official at that level is making any difference. None. I have seen so much corruption and so much like corporatocracy grifting that has directly impacted the care that I provide to my family, to me, to my clients. And COVID was kind of the final nail. There was just so much wrong from even a strictly epidemiologic perspective on how that was managed. That I was like, oh my God, I was getting so optimistic. I was actually thinking maybe council seats, like maybe I can make a difference in Kentucky, even around something like abortion. Yeah. And um, it was before the neck tattoos, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how that would go. I don't know if that would go so well, but. Um, well, not if you're voting red. <laughs> no, no, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I, I and then even as, I got off my 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 train of thought there, but but I, I was so I was becoming so much more optimistic. And I was like a Bernie Sanders guy. I was like progression, yeah, like we're get we're seeing change. Like I, I don't know what happened, but something just snapped for me. And I was like, I don't think anybody really like really cares at that level. I just can't trust you anymore. And the COVID thing exposed so much issue so many issues that I already had a, like kind of knew about, but then suddenly everybody was like, like you had mentioned this earlier, suddenly everybody was like hailing pharmaceutical companies as being the good guys. And I was like, are you guys out of your mind? Yeah, like, I know. The amount of ongoing lawsuits for something like the Gardasil vaccine, the one to prevent cervical cancer, there's ongoing litigation in every single state. Are you guys fucking insane? And then I was like, wait, hold on. I have to be compassionate about everybody's journey and this and that. And then I was like, I can't be running for office and getting myself into this because I become so emotionally invested in the outcome that it's maybe not for me. Maybe I'm not good at just saying the thing that needs to be said to get it passed. Like, I'm just not that guy. So instead, I work in my own little enclave. I work with individuals one-on-one and I try to see like, where, where can I help you? So even if you want to have a hospital worth, how can I help you navigate that? That's where I feel like maybe that's the optimist in me coming back. Like one by one, I get yeah. to know people, I get them to love me, and then I, get, and then I can love them back. But one thing I'll add, uh, and then I'll stop talking, but... <laughs> it's a podcast. It's what we're supposed to be doing, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's true. Um, I think one of the biggest pains that we're going, the growing pains that we're going through right now is everybody is craving authenticity and they won't admit it to themselves. Like you really actually want somebody to be authentically, genuinely them. Even if you don't like what they have to say, you want them to be, just show them all of your cards. That's what we want so badly. But then we punish people for doing that because we're so insecure about showing that ourselves. So if I went into politics, I wouldn't be able to be authentically me. And I can't be anybody but me. And you can't be me either because I'm fucking Nathan Riley. You're Lindsay (laughs) Soprano. I'm fucking Lindsay fucking Soprano. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You do you, I'll do me, and we'll shake hands at somewhere in the middle. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, so anyways, that 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 authenticity thing, I just see it lacking everywhere. All of the like five hacks to fix endometriosis, the greatest molecular hydrogen therapy machine. Like, you guys are just blowing smoke up each other's asses. Like who's actually doing the work? I'm doing the work and you're doing the work. Like these yeah. podcasts are, these conversations are doing the work. So the smoke screen of what people think they need because they're being billboarded at every moment and ever every day, there's this little part of us that wants that authenticity. And I can say that when I die, whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now, I have been authentically me from the moment I put on my big, my big boy pants when I was 18. Maybe it wasn't 18, probably like 28. (laughs) You're a man, Um, let's be real, 28. (laughs) Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Um, I I can say I've been authentically me and that feels really, really good. If I just keep doing that, I think I'm going to be just fine. And I think you're going to be just fine because you're authentically Lindsay. Yeah, I am. And, and, And I agree with that entirely because being, you know, I ask these people to come onto this show and be a guest here and to share their stories 
And if I'm not going to be authentic and I'm not going to be real and I'm not going to be raw and gritty and vulnerable and honest and open and bleed all over this microphone, then I have no business being behind it because the whole point is that I'm trying to shake some cages. I'm trying to rattle us up to pay more attention to take our own healthcare into our own hands and take it away from the people that are making decisions for our bodies and for us. They don't live in it. They don't know what I feel. All I know is that I've explained my story to so many doctors and nobody has gone home and said, you know what? I'm going to figure out how we're going to fucking fix this girl. Yeah. Not one time. And so here I am trying to create an environment and I've got all kinds of things that are coming out that is going to be amazing for my listeners and for everybody on this entire planet from my perspective to help shift this because I hate our healthcare system and I hate the way I have been treated within it. Pregnant or not, it doesn't matter. If we are not advocating for ourselves, then like you said, just nobody like, else is going to do it. Yeah, nobody's no going to do take it. Care of it. So no. you have to look out for yourself. And hopefully that means that that, that love. So, so here's the, I love that you brought this up, Lindsay. So like we have a whole bunch of broken down doctors and nurses, right? They're supposed to be caring for other people, yet they're working within a system that has dehumanized them from the, the moment they set foot into their first training program where you're, I mean, I had a program director tell me your family needs, you're distracted your family needs to know that they come second now because you're a doctor. And I was like, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. She's a mega babe. We've had two babies together and I find her hotter than ever. And I just want to sometimes just sit down and watch TV with her and give her a foot rub. And that's not going to be, that's going to be preceded by my work responsibilities. Like I, I, I have deep compassion for all these healthcare workers who have never been incentivized to love themselves. If you can't love yourself, how are you possibly going to care for somebody with chronic regional pain syndrome? That's a really tall ask of somebody. So the whole, the whole foundation of what we call medicine needs to just be shifted. And I don't know how we do that. People say politics and policy and all this. Like, I don't know if that's really it. I think it comes down to this. And there's a reason I don't work in that system because I didn't see it possible that I could change it from within. Well, you can. And it's one of the reasons why so many people are popping out of corporate America too. I mean, I couldn't ever do it because it's just not my jam. It, it's just one of those things where we have to, we have to, we have to love ourselves and choose us first because other than that, if we're choosing everybody before us and we're choosing patriarchy, we're, ch we're, ch we're, we're, we're chasing these big, huge dreams that we thought we were going to be having instead of chasing your own health and your own wellness and your own care, you're going to, you're going to suck for everybody in your life. And when you start yeah. focusing on you, it's a win for everybody because right. it goes, it rolls down, right? I can't be on the bottom of that ladder. I have to be at the top. And when you start to shift that mindset, and it's hard to do, and it's not going to happen overnight, but when you start to chip away a little bit of that mindset and changing your focus so that it's more on you and your well-being and your healthcare and advocating for your own body and your family and your spouse and what have you, it, things shift. Yeah. It's, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. How long have you been doing what you're doing? Well, I got fired uh September 3rd, 2021. So it's only been about 3 years that I've been fully immersed in what I'm doing now, but in that time I have uh, I mean, it, fully immersed in the sense that like I've got no other income. I need to start making money like because we've got bills um, we had to buy health insurance. Who knew, who knew that health insurance was so expensive? Holy it's shit. Like so expensive. And guess what? It's still sucks. I know. Yeah, and it still sucks. Yeah. I have like the primo, primo PPO, you know, plan in yeah. California. And I still can't get like acupuncture or chiropractic. Yeah, or, I mean, it's yeah. just like, give me a break. Forget it. Forget it. <laughs> These insurance brokers are just full of shit. So I know, but, but I started, uh, doing my original podcast, which is now being rebooted. It's the ob Gyno wino podcast where I review the clinical summaries and, and put, impart some of my insights from a functional medicine and um, even a holistic lifestyle coach background and home birth and all of that. I, I impart that in there. But I started doing that when I was in fellowship in San Diego. So that was in like 2019. And as I was recording those summaries, it was like really to help me study for my surgical board exams, which is a gnarly shit fest, five hours just being peppered with questions, very high fail rate. Um, like 20% of people don't pass. So um, from a board standpoint, that was like a really hard thing. So I was, I was going through all of ACOG's you know, practice bulletins and all their guidelines. And as I was publishing these, I thought it would be helpful to other OBGYNs, but it was all these midwives and doulas who were listening. And I was like, 
you guys like this? Oh. Like, that's that's cool. And I just started exploring that because I loved midwives. I didn't have any skin in the game. I was still a hospital-based OBGYN working full-time at Scripps in Encinitas. Oh. Um, but then I, but I was like, well, and I was pairing a bottle of wine with each episode and I just was having so much fun with it. And then I got through all of every one of their guidelines. There was an episode for each and I stopped doing the podcast and started doing my, my current one. But what I learned through that was that this, the, the, the ability to build bridges with out of hospital, um, you know, community birth workers was actually something that I really loved doing. Like if, if I could get a little bit of trust from that community, imagine how we could learn from one another. And that's, that kind of set the stage, I think, for what I'm, for where I'm at now. But I've also had so many people reaching out now for my support that we had to come up, we started launching programs. We've got one for pregnancy and postpartum support, which is this massive undertaking, but it's called the Born Free Method. We are now launching Clear and Free, which is your holistic solution to persistent HPV. If you wanted to talk about fuckery in the medical system, Man, the Gardasil vaccine and how we're managing um, pap smears and HPV screens, holy shit, it is heartbreaking. It is really, really bad what we're doing out there. God. That just makes me, I have HPV, but if you don't have HPV, you're a fucking loser. I mean, come on, let's be real. <laughs> it's like 100% of people have HPV. Yeah. I mean, yeah, give me a break. I mean, I, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is what it is. And I mean, I had fun getting it. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Did you have fun? What did you learn? <laughs> did you have fun getting HPV? Why? Yes, I, I did. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real lord of a time. No, yeah. it's just, it's, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, we, you can go down the slippery slope. I mean, we could talk for, you know, five hours more than that, just on that alone. It's just, it's, it's mind boggling. But I am so grateful to have met you because it's a conversation that we've not had on this show yet in relation to what we've been talking about today. And it, it's eye-opening to me in so many ways. And I hope that there are mothers and to-be mothers and to-be fathers that have been listening today because one of the things that I love about you too is how this process for you really, it really, really made you such a good father. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Like just that transition into being a father and all of that, how, how this has made you just such an incredible man, incredible husband, incredible fa- you know, father and all of that through this process, because I think that the fathers are, are missed a lot in this process as well. And, yeah. you know, just the moms having the baby. Well, the dad also kind of has a little bit to do with it here. Can you speak just for a moment, a little bit about the fatherhood side before we, before we hit the dusty trail here? Let me start by saying that uh, you don't get the birth or the kids that you want. You get the birth or the kids that you need. And it's like mm. going to Burning Man or doing mushrooms. You don't get the trip you want. You get the trip you need. Um, like that. where do I start with that one? I so know, I guess <laughs> no. It's 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 a good. It's a it's a lovely. God, it's such a beautiful conversation that is starting to unfold. And I and I think um, I'll start by saying that when I was in my training, you know, it was like the dad wants to be involved. He wants to cut the cord in this and that. And it was like, okay, dad, cut the cord or whatever. There you are. We've, yeah, we've kind of just the sort of mystical side of this birth experience and the role of a father, a conscious like man in the room has, there's two ways that this has gone. In the one camp, it's let's bring them in and let them cut the cord. Oh, dada, yeah, cut the cord. And it's like infantilizing. On the other hand, there's a lot of women out there that are like, men shouldn't be evolved in birth. And a lot of people are already going to hear this episode and be like, what's this fucking guy have to do with birth? Like <laughs> birth belongs to women. And I get that. I hear that. It's a, everything has been taken from like the, the ruling elites, generally white European men over the throughout human history. I get that. And a true feminist is going to honor what the divine masculine in all of us brings to the conversation. We, unfortunately, have been living in a hyper-masculine, patriarchal, um, hierarchical, hegemonical society for uh, t- time in memoriam. So when we start to push back, when we start to say, you know, feminine, 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 I am all for that. And I want people to consider that this is not like male, female, penis, ball, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the energetics of the sun and the moon. The moon being the yin, the feminine, the sun being the yang, the, the masculine. The Tao, like a lot of our Eastern philosophies, they, they honor this as a part of, an important part of being alive and being well and being well grounded in your, in your sort of full embodiment as a human. You have the yin and yang symbol where one consumes the other in this ever going cycle. The center point is the way of the Tao. 
you have these two forces at play in your wiring in your house and every component of the universe. These divine, these sacred polarities are everything in childbirth. So there are men out there who don't just want to be there cutting the cord. They want to be fully immersed in the most magical thing that a man could ever possibly be witness to. And it's their own child. That is the most compelling thing that any man will ever go through is witnessing the birth of their own child. And if you, it, it, if you don't think that, then you weren't there. Like, like you weren't there if you don't believe that. So um, now that doesn't mean every man has to be, or, or every young boy has to have a baby and be a father in order to become a man. And if you're a man and you want to have a real growth, like rocket ship to like real masculinity, taking advantage of the invitation and opportunity to sit with the person you love the most while they are bringing your baby earth side is the ultimate rite of passage in a world that is devoid of rites of passage. So there's an opportunity there for you to be the mountain and to witness a person going through the tribulation of their life without coming to it with a solution, without interrupting it, without intervening in some way that shows that you're the, like the, the CEO or whatever you, know, whatever you were taught by your dad or grandfather, being able to hold space as the mountain does for the careening, raging river running through the valley, that is the role, the, the opportunity for a man. And being good at that is going to change your sex life. It's going to change how you relate to your mother, your sister, your children, yourself, being able to hold space is not something that a lot of people are really dialed in on, but birth is the ultimate opportunity to start exercising that. So I bring a lot of men into my conversations in the Born Free Method program. There's a whole unit dedicated to the dads. Um, you never get it right when it's, when it's time, but in retrospect, you always think about like, wow, like what a privilege that I was invited into this space. Like what an awesome opportunity to be a part of this. And it's way beyond cutting the cord. I, wow, that was so eloquently put because I, I, I like that we're giving some space, a holding space for the fathers in this part because I think that they end up getting kind of lost in the, uh, the shuffle of it. Yeah. And um, I, I definitely want to honor that part of, you know, I don't know, bringing a child into the world. <laughs> <You know? laughs> kind of important. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. This has yeah. been so incredibly wonderful. I, 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 <sighs> I want to keep talking to you, but we can't. <laughs> Before we leave, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Um, and also, we need to find out where we find you online because I know you've got a bunch of new stuff coming out. The thing I want to leave people with is stop taking this so seriously. Like, give yourself a break. Give everybody a break. Don't go on Twitter and start unleashing hell on people because they said something about Israel or Gaza or something that you don't agree with. Stop taking this so seriously and just do your very best and trust that every single person that crosses your path is doing their very best. Hold a little bit of space. Give them a little bit of grace. And, oh, that's a t-shirt right there. That is. Hold that's a, a big time. That's a bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and just stop, like, like, just stop caring, like, stop being so cynical and so serious about everything. Like, there is so many beautiful flowers to smell. There was this um, National Geographic photojournalist that this was before COVID, but he had said, you know, I have the best job in the world. He did a TED talk and he said, I have the best job in the world. I get to go around the world and take pictures of beautiful things. And he said, if you don't have a job like that, you're going to start to believe that the world is a fearful, terrible place where everything is falling apart. And maybe it's true. I don't know. But in my direct experience with life, there's a lot of beautiful things. There's a lot of beautiful things to taste beverages to consume, drugs to imbibe, um, sex to be had, flowers to be smelled, trees to admire. Like we're in Kentucky. I was just in Pittsburgh and there was like blazing red and orange, yellow in my hometown. Like this photojournalist said, don't forget that there is so much beauty out there. So guys, like just stop taking everything so seriously and literally stop and smell the flowers. There is so much out there for you to see and for you to enjoy in whatever time you have left on this planet. Yeah, I mean, and it gives us an opportunity to go out and get HPV. <laughs> yeah, go get, your, go get some HPV. Go Everybody get some else HPV. is doing it. <laughs> We're going to leave with that because that is a very Lindsay <laughs> way to end while you're at it. I yeah, mean, let's just of, do it. We're, we're like going to go there. Got to get them all. Got to collect them all. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. I'm leaving it with this because we have to. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time here today with me. This has just been epic beyond epic. It's been really nice to get to know you even further than what we've already done. So thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Likewise. Oh, can I tell people where to find me? I oh, forgot yeah, to yeah. even say that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's okay. Went... We were talking about HPV and flowers. I mean, we can get I, distracted. Yeah. <laughs> my like, poetic narcissism took over. Um, just a little bit. It's no <laughs> big deal. <laughs> Um, so pregnancy and postpartum support, bornfreemethod.com. Um, for people who are struggling with a conversation on any vaccines, immune system, HPV, pap smears, all of the cervical cancer screening stuff, a whole lifestyle program, clear and free, or clearhpv.com. I'm on Instagram at Nathan Riley OBGYN. I've got a podcast called the Holistic OBGYN Podcast. The other one's called the OB Gyno Wino Podcast, but go to belovedholistics.com. That's my website where you can find most of that. Otherwise, man, but I, 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 I wouldn't, I could even leave my phone number. I don't really care. I really just love <laughs> connecting with people. I won't do that because you never no, don't know. Don't do that. Let's not do that. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I really do love hearing from people. And Lindsay, to be invited into conversations like this is, it's like a way of being. I just love how you are and, and to, to, to be able to co-regulate with you for an hour and a half has just been a joy. So thank you. Thank you. That's, you've just, I feel like I'm blushing a little bit. You've been giving me so many accolades throughout this entire episode. No, that's the HPV. That's not blood. You're not blushing. Oh, that's, right. oh, so that's my bad. No. That's my bad. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Your HPV is showing. Oh, there it is. <laughs> well, thank you again for your time. And you are just incredible. And keep on doing what you're doing because we got to do it one, you know, one person at a time. We just keep on going. That's what, that's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go ice my face. <laughs> you are exclusively invited to share this empowering and sacred VIP pain journey together. Let's get to the heart of how to heal with you by my side. I'd love to have my community of listeners help drive some more traffic to the show so we can continue to help others on their journeys through pain and trauma together. So let's do some reviews of the show if you could. That would be helpful. And also, just like Nathan said, he was talking about, hey, he loves connecting with people. If you know somebody that is going through something similar to what we've been talking about today, send them our way. Send them to me, send them to Nathan. We are here. We would love to connect with them and hear your heartfelt stories of strength and wisdom and grit and here to help support in anything that we can. Please follow the Pain Game Podcast wherever you digest your podcast content. We will be there. Visit us at thepaingamepodcast.com and follow us on all the socials. Thanks for listening, my little VIPs. Catch you on the other side. <laughs>